1948, a pharmaceutical company called Letterly Labs came out with an antibiotic called areomycin, areo meaning gold. It was a reference to the gold-colored bacteria it came from, but also a subtle nod to all the cash they'd make off this drug. Areomycin was the first commercially available tetracycline, a class of antibiotics that promised to treat a wider spectrum of bacteria than any antibiotic they'd seen to date. But there was a problem. Antibiotics hadn't previously been a great money-making strategy, and the way that Letterly went about it, along with another pharma company you've definitely heard of, landed them a decades-long lawsuit by the US government. So in this video, I'll ask, how big of an advancement were tetracyclines, what allowed Letterly to make so much money off this antibiotic, and how did this one class of drug lead to such a long lawsuit? First, a bit of a refresher. In World War II, the American government paid certain American pharmaceutical companies to make as much penicillin as they could, and they succeeded there, but as a result of flooding the market with this massive supply of antibiotics, no single company made a ton of money from penicillin sales. But it left them with research and development teams. So of course, a bunch of these companies pivoted to different antibiotics after the war. One of those companies was Letterly Labs, a New York-based pharmaceutical company owned by a larger chemical company called American Cyanamid. Letterly would go on to make an oral polio vaccine and the multivitamin Centrum, but in the middle of World War II, they decided to look for antibiotics. In the last part of this series, we talked about how scientists had found a potent source of antibiotics in microbes they found in the soil. A group of bacteria called Actinomycetes were especially useful. Scientists at Rutgers University found a few potential good ones starting in 1940, but the big one was Streptomycin, which they found in 1943. It became the first in a class of antibiotics called aminoglycosides, and the first effective antibiotic against tuberculosis. So Letterly decided that they would follow Rutgers lead and focus their search on soil microbes too. And in 1943, they hired a retired botany professor named Benjamin Duggar to lead the search. And just like the Rutgers researchers, he and his team would have to test a ton of soil samples. Then, when they found an interesting microbe, they'd put it on a petri dish with some bacteria and look for rings of growth inhibition around the sample. A little different than in this picture, but same idea. A bigger ring meant the microbe had a stronger antibacterial effect. But unlike the Rutgers team, Duggar was able to recruit folks from all over the world to collect soil samples and ship them to him in New York. Rutgers was pretty much limited to the northeastern United States, but Duggar's network was so big that he had people sending him soil samples from North Africa to South America. And by the end, his team would end up testing over 3,500 strains of bacteria. Now, as great as penicillin and streptomycin were for the time, neither worked on every bacterium out there. So Duggar focused on finding broad-spectrum antibiotics, drugs that were effective against the two main divisions of bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Unfortunately, most of the antibiotics they found at first were too toxic to actually test in humans. But in August of 1945, they tested a candidate in a soil sample from the University of Missouri's Sanborn Field. Duggar called the yellowish microbe Streptomyces areofascians and the antibiotic areomycin. Again, areo meaning gold. Then, when they tested it for antibacterial properties, they found it effectively stopped gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, including strains that had shown resistance to sulfa drugs, a popular type of antibacterial at the time. And even better, follow-up tests showed that areomycin was mostly non-toxic in rodents, which meant that now it was time to start thinking about human trials. And they did some cool things here. First, they had learned from penicillin production that different strains of the same microbe could make more or less antibiotic substances. So they checked a bunch of strains of Streptomyces areofascians and isolated the one that made the most antibiotic. Then, in another page from the penicillin playbook, they grew them in giant fermentation tanks so they could make huge amounts of areomycin. And by 1947, they'd made enough areomycin to do more animal experiments. The second cool thing about areomycin was that it could be taken orally. Most other antibiotics were injection only, which meant you needed a medical professional to shoot you up. Some of the first humans to get areomycin were patients with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, a disease with a high mortality rate which didn't have any treatments at the time, so they got the drug on a compassionate use basis. Areomycin seemed to improve outcomes, so doctors at Boston City Hospital started experimenting with it too. They found that it could successfully treat typhoid fever, typhus, and certain strep infections and a doctor at Harlem Hospital found that it was useful against chlamydia. Letterly would conduct some more testing in-house, but also decided to give samples of areomycin to a bunch of independent researchers and had them do their own research. And animal studies were mostly positive. Areomycin killed some types of bacteria, but not others. Like, researchers confirmed that it was effective at treating infections from gram-positive bacteria like strep and gram-negative bacteria like the one that caused typhoid fever. 
At the same time, though, researchers at Johns Hopkins couldn't get orally administered areomycin to cure infections of certain pneumococcal bacteria. Within a few years of research, multiple research groups had tried areomycin with mixed results. It was effective against gonorrhea, but not as effective as penicillin. It worked against a couple urinary tract infections, but only about as well as streptomycin. Meanwhile, some research groups straight up couldn't get it to clear certain infections. So before we go any further, let's talk about how it works. Animal cells and bacteria cells make proteins thanks to ribosomes. These are the organelles that read messenger RNA, genetic information transcribed from DNA, then they assemble amino acids and churn out chains of polypeptides and proteins. Then the cell or body uses those proteins for important functions. Tetracyclines like areomycin bind to the ribosome and keep bacteria from making important proteins. It's a really similar process to what happens with streptomycin and the other aminoglycosides. But the big difference is that tetracyclines like areomycin are bacteriostatic. They slow the growth of bacteria, while aminoglycosides are bactericidal. They actively destroy bacteria. This is what makes tetracyclines work against all kinds of bacteria, not just gram-positive or gram-negatives. Its mechanism affects an organelle in both types of cells. And the fact that it had such a broad spectrum made areomycin really valuable. Plus, it was becoming obvious that some kinds of bacteria were developing resistance to the current crop of antibiotics. So areomycin was a good second option for when penicillin or streptomycin didn't work. Areomycin got FDA approval in 1948, and Letterly's parent company, American Cyanamid, started promoting it right away. They spent $2 million to ship samples to doctors across the country, which is something that pharma companies didn't really do at the time. Then in September of 1949, they finally got their patent, which meant that unlike penicillin or streptomycin, they could make some serious money off this drug. But Cyanamid wasn't the only pharma company looking for new antibiotics. A few other companies were using their new government subsidized facilities to look for a drug they could actually make money from. And one of those companies was a little Brooklyn-based chemical company called Pfizer, but way different than the Pfizer that you and I know today. Their claim to fame in the early 20th century was citric acid. And before World War II, their experience with pharmaceuticals was mostly manufacturing drugs that they sold to other companies. But they did it on a huge scale. They made literally more penicillin than any other pharmaceutical company in the world. But again, because of the weird subsidy situation, they didn't see a ton of profit from it. Just like Letterly, after the war, they decided to look for an antibiotic that they could patent and actually make some money from. So in 1945, Pfizer started hunting for soil microbes too. And just like all the other research groups, it was a numbers game. Look at tens of thousands of soil samples and hopefully find something useful. But Pfizer took it a step further. They looked at over 130,000 samples coming everywhere from mine shafts to deserts to ocean trenches. And their winner came in 1949 in a sample from Terre Haute, Indiana, Streptomyces ramosus, a bacteria that produced a golden antibiotic of its own. But unfortunately for Pfizer, it seemed too similar to areomycin to be patentable. It was another broad spectrum antibiotic from an actinomycetes, just like the already patented areomycin. So before they could even think of marketing it, Pfizer would need more research, including understanding how it worked. And maybe that research would uncover something about the drug that made it different from Cyanamid's drug. So they hired a Harvard professor named Robert Woodward, a chemist that had previously worked on penicillin research. Woodward and the Pfizer team figured out that both Letterly and Pfizer's compounds were based around a four-ring structure, which gave these molecules the name tetracyclines. Tetra for four, cycline for ring. Areomycin had a chlorine atom on it, making it chlortetracycline. Meanwhile, Pfizer's antibiotic had a hydroxyl group that areomycin didn't have making it oxytetracycline. And that difference was good enough to qualify for a separate patent. Pfizer named their antibiotic Teramycin, a branding choice to show that it came from the earth. They filed a patent in 1949 and got FDA approval in early 1950. Unfortunately for Pfizer, Ariamycin already had 26% of the entire US market for antibiotics. So as soon as they got FDA approval, everyone in Pfizer's very tiny sales department called every American drug wholesaler they could, gave the sales pitch for Teramycin, and offered discounts. This is when Pfizer properly transitions from little citric acid guys to a big deal pharma company. From 1950 to 1952, they grew their sales team from eight members to hundreds of members. But their product was basically the same as Letterly's, so they'd have to go even harder on marketing to get a competitive edge. They ended up hiring a guy named Dr. Arthur Sackler, and he came up with the idea to introduce their drugs to doctors through the kind of materials that doctors read, 
like medical journals. And in 1952, they took out their first advertisement in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA. Eventually, they would make up two-thirds of all antibiotic advertising in the journal. They also started releasing informational videos, some marketed as educational materials for doctors and some for the general public. And come on, check out this production quality for the 1950s. It's incredible. It's tough to say how much of their success was due to the quality of the product and how much was due to marketing, but before long, tetracyclines were outselling both penicillin and streptomycin. But tetracyclines weren't the only new broad-spectrum antibiotic on the market. A different company, Park Davis, was working on a drug as early as 1944. And in April 1945, the same year that Duggar found Streptomyces aureofashions, one of their researchers isolated a new species of bacteria from a soil sample sent from Venezuela, what he called Streptomyces venezuelae. The bacteria seemed to have antibacterial properties in a petri dish, and the active substance worked against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, making it a broad-spectrum antibiotic. An analysis in 1947 showed that the active ingredient wasn't a tetracycline, but chloramphenicol, a chemical based around a nitrobenzene ring. They sold the drug under the name chloromycetin, and it turned out to be especially useful against vector-borne diseases like typhus, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and a few other diseases. And before Pfizer hired Sackler, Park Davis captured about a third of the broad-spectrum antibiotic market, making $55 million a year off chloromycetin. But soon after the drug hit the market, a handful of stories started popping up about chloromycetin users getting a blood condition called aplastic anemia. So a few activists pressured the FDA to ban the antibiotic, but there wasn't enough good data to show that the drug actually caused the condition. So the FDA concluded that the benefits outweighed the risks, recommended the equivalent of a warning label, which is actually still there today, and went about business as usual. Now, even these days, it's tough to prove whether chloromycetin caused an increase in aplastic anemia. But even if it didn't, all these bad stories were coming out about it and not the other broad-spectrum antibiotics. So Park Davis's reputation took a hit and chloromycetin sales tanked. By 1953, areomycin and teramycin made up 92% of the American market for broad-spectrum antibiotics. This helped Pfizer capture 26% and literally 23% of the entire American antibiotic market. Now, at this point, sales were based off of what was essentially secret recipes. Scientists knew that teramycin and areomycin were different chemicals, but they didn't totally understand how they worked. By 1952, a team of Pfizer scientists led by Dr. Lloyd Conover found that the tetracycline ring was really the only thing that had an antibiotic effect. So of course, Pfizer and Letterly immediately raced to patent regular tetracycline, which became this huge legal battle, but not for the reasons that you might be thinking. The timeline is important here, so I'm gonna bring up one of the legal documents. Pfizer filed a patent for base tetracycline on October 23rd, 1952. On March 16, 1953, Cyanamid filed their version. Then in October of 53, Pfizer withdrew their original patent and submitted a new one. Around the same time, two other companies, Bristol Labs and Hayden Chemical, independently created tetracyclines of their own without using either of the previously patented drugs, oxy or chlortetracycline. Hayden submitted their patent in September and Bristol in October, but both were rejected on the grounds that they were basically just making half-baked areomycin. This was bad news for Pfizer and Cyanamid's businesses. Tetracycline prices had already dropped by two-thirds from 1948 to 1952, and more competition would drive the prices down even further. This is also around the time when Pfizer and Cyanamid learned that they both had pending patent applications for the same chemical. So, they made a deal. On November 3rd, 1953, American Cyanamid made a bid for Hayden Chemicals assets, including their patent application for tetracycline. Then they said to Pfizer, we'll withdraw our patent if we can do a cross license for tetracycline when you guys get the patent. That way we can keep this market as small as possible. Pfizer got the patent for tetracycline on January 11th, 1955, which they sold under the trade name Tetracin. And in accordance with their earlier deal, they sold Cyanamid a license to make their version of tetracycline, which they called Acromycin. Pfizer eventually sold limited licenses to two other companies, Squibb and Upjohn, and they extended a license to Bristol Pharmaceuticals to make, use, and sell the drug as well. But of course, all of this still looked a lot like price fixing, so they got in trouble with America's federal trade commissions on antitrust grounds. Separately, lawyers also claimed that Pfizer had committed some serious fraud when filing their base tetracycline patent, which is where this document comes from. I'll link the PDF down in the description with my other sources, but the case focuses on whether tetracycline could even be patented at all. To summarize a meaty 83 pages, Pfizer tried to patent tetracycline on the grounds that they'd created something novel. 
But according to the filing, Pfizer chemists had found tetracycline in samples of areomycin, which meant they knew they hadn't created anything novel. But Pfizer submitted a patent for tetracycline anyway, and thus had done a fraud. The lawsuit went back and forth and lasted until 1982 when the government ultimately lost the suit. They couldn't find evidence that Pfizer was deliberately trying to deceive the patent office. And while the lawsuit was kind of a letdown, the story isn't over because a few more companies got involved with their own broad spectrum antibiotics. Like a Filipino doctor who worked for Eli Lilly found a soil bacteria that produced an antibiotic called erythromycin. They patented it in 1953 and sold it under the name Ilotycin, or Ilocene, after the region in the Philippines where it was found. Erythromycin is a macrolide antibiotic, which are structurally different than tetracyclines, but work similarly. They inhibit protein synthesis at the ribosome. And in a time when all these broad spectrum antibiotics were coming out, this one didn't turn out to be a blockbuster, but it was still a useful tool in the tool chest, especially against germs resistant to penicillin. And we'll see this in the next video about antibiotic resistance, but we were gonna need all the antibiotic candidates we could get. But back to the 1950s, scientists at Pfizer and Cyanamid kept focusing on better tetracyclines. And at first, the process seems familiar keep culturing the soil bacteria, and figure out which ones made the most powerful strains of tetracycline. These naturally occurring antibiotics are considered the first generation tetracyclines, but things really took off when chemists explored semi-synthetic versions, what are called second generation tetracyclines. Basically, they'd start with a naturally produced tetracycline and modify that. Like, Pfizer was able to chemically modify teramycin into methacycline in 1966, which they sold until 2001. And methacycline was a chemical step towards probably the most famous antibiotic in this group, doxycycline, also known as vibromycin. And in 1956, Letterly did something similar. They found a new antibiotic called democlocycline through their soil microbe screening program. It wasn't a massive jump forward, but it was modified into sancycline, which is the simplest form of tetracyclines. Then in 1971 and 72, that was converted into minocycline, which became the most potent tetracycline antibacterial they'd had at that point. Second generation tetracyclines held us over for a while. Antibacterial resistance finally started getting more public attention at the end of the 1980s, at which point scientists at Letterly started looking for what would become the third generation tetracyclines. The first big ones were the glycylcyclines, like tigacycline, which came out in the 1990s, and it worked as intended. It was effective against gram-positive and gram-negative multidrug resistant bacteria. And more recently, scientists developed omatocycline, the first in a subclass of aminomethylcycline antibacterials. There was also a totally synthetic fluorocycline called aravacycline, which came out in 2012. Also, I am very aware that those last two sentences just sound like pharmacology gibberish, but the point I'm trying to make is that scientists did develop new tetracycline drugs that are effective against resistant bacteria. And tetracyclines are still popular antibacterial options to this day. Even first-gen tetracyclines still have use cases, like against chlamydia. But all this time, I've been leaving out a big part of the story. When areomycin first came out, scientists noticed that when you gave the antibiotic to chickens, they grew much bigger, much faster. And while it was great for poultry farmers' profits, the widespread use of antibiotics in agriculture led to a modern existential threat to humanity. In the next video, we'll finally get into the history of antibiotic resistance.